church, and we are a place where you matter. Our mission here is centered around change lives, changing lives. We believe this happens through three important relationships, intimacy with God, intentionality with family, and influence with others. God has something he wants to say specifically to you wherever you are. Our hope is that you leave encouraged and closer to him than ever before. We'd love to connect with you online at Plum Creek church or on social media to see how Plum Creek is impacting our community and what opportunities we have for you and your family to get connected. If you'd like to support the ministry we're doing here in Castle Rock, two easiest ways are through the Give tab on our website or via your mobile device by texting any dollar amount to 720-606-5563. It's a secure connection with simple instructions to get set up. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you'll enjoy this message. Well, happy Easter, Plum Creek. Come on, stand with us. We're going to celebrate our risen Savior today. Sing it out. I was born my shame. Who can carry that kind of weight? It was my too. Till I met you. Hey! I was breathing, but not alive. And all my failures, I tried to hide. It was my turn. Till I met
Let's make this a declaration today. Let's sing it out with all we got. Church. My name is Olivia. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you for coming to celebrate with us today. We know there are a lot of great churches in Castle Rock, so we appreciate you being here. If you are a guest with us for the first time, you are new to Plum Creek, we want you to know one thing. Plum Creek is all about seeing changed lives changing lives. And what that simply means is we believe what God has done in us is not only for us. We exist to see lives changed in this community and in turn those lives invest in others and we would love for you to be a part of that. If you are a guest, we would love if you would take a quick second and fill out one of these next sub cards in the seat back pocket in front of you. This is not scary, I promise. It is a quick email or phone call this week to answer any questions you have and let you know how you can get plugged in here at Plum Creek. You can take your time on these and turn them in at the buckets at the end of service. Well, this morning we have an opportunity to give back to God and giving is something we do every single week here at Plum Creek as we believe we should trust God in all areas of our life, especially with our finances. So if you're wondering how to get involved with giving, there's an envelope also in that seat back pocket with instructions with four easy ways to give. Again, our ushers will be at the door at the end of service to receive that giving. But this Easter, I want you to know about a special opportunity to give back. As a church, we partner with Project Rescue and Project Rescue is an incredible organization that focuses on the rescue and restoration of victims of human trafficking through the love and power of Jesus Christ. And it is proven that education is one of the best tools to break the cycle of exploitation. So this Easter, we wanna raise enough money to send 25 individuals to college. And we are looking to raise $40,000. I don't know if you've been to college recently or you're paying for someone to go to college or you're still paying for someone to go to college. Um, 25 individuals for $40,000 to go to college is a pretty smoking deal, right? And so this is where that whole change lives, changing lives comes into play. And we would love for you to be involved in this opportunity. There were little handouts on your chair as you came in today that tells you all about this opportunity and a ways that you can give. So we would love for you to be included in that. Again, happy Easter. I'm so glad you're with us this morning. 
As I was praying for this week and preparing my own heart, and I was praying for all of you who are gonna be coming to Easter services and joining us online, I just wanted this to be not another Sunday. My prayer is that this is not just another Easter service or another routine thing we have to check off our to-do list today. May this be an incredible time for you to reflect, for you to respond, and for you to ultimately remember. Who is this man? This man who turned an instrument of torture and death into a symbol of hope. Who is this man? Who conquered every temptation and yet willingly carried the consequence of our inability to do the same? Who is this man? Whose power healed others, but who wouldn't use that power to save himself? The son of a carpenter no one knew, who terrified the most powerful empire on earth. All without a sword, soldier, or whisper of violence. Who is this man? Who is this man who commanded the winds and waves and our own souls to be still? And they obey. And why was he tortured? Who is this man? who claimed he was the bread of life and turned a few loaves of bread into a feast for 10,000. Who is this man who was born in a manger, surrounded by strangers and shepherds? And why, even though he died, are we still talking about him? Is this man and why did his followers claim that he rose from the grave and what if the message of Jesus is true that there is hope that death does not win and the same could be true for us today it would mean there's one question we have to answer. Who is this man? Well, good morning and happy Easter. Thank you so much for being here. And I want to say hello to those that are across the hallway in our additional seating area and also those that are watching online. Before we begin today, I think it would be very appropriate for us to pray for our brothers and sisters on the other side of the world. Uh, there was an attack in some churches this morning. And when I left this morning, it said that there were over 200, I haven't heard the latest count, but over 200 have died. Can you bow your heads with me for just a second? Father, as we even reflect asking this question, who is this man? We know there are some on the other side of the world in Sri Lanka that were doing what we're doing here, celebrating this day. And Lord, their lives were senselessly taken. And so, Father, today, these are our brothers and sisters, and we pray that you will comfort their families, that you will be with them. And Lord, most importantly, we pray that the senseless killing would stop. We love you. And we thank you that we live in a country where we have the opportunity to worship, to worship in a public gathering, and to give praise to your incredible name. We love you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the question that's posed in that video that you just saw is an important one. And my heart's desire today is that that would be oh so much more than a trivia question to you. That you wouldn't just say, oh yeah, I know that one because I went to Sunday school back in the day. But that there would be something about it that resonates and connects in your heart. If you're like me, I'd be willing to bet you are that you love a good story. Do you like a good story? 
And so if someone says, oh, I read this book and it's a great novel and you need to check it out, it's likely that you're going to say, tell me a little more because you're going to want to know if that should be a book that you should buy. Or if someone says, I saw this amazing movie and the story was incredible and you have to, you have to make sure that you go see it. Tell me some more because we love a good story. And, and a story moves from a good story to a great story when something unique happens in the context of it, when, when the characters and the people and the relationships and the predicaments, the circumstances, sometimes the tragedy, the pain and the loss, even the victory, the celebration and the overcoming connect with us, when they connect with our hearts. These elements of a good story are what lead us into an experience of some kind and turn it into a great story. It's amazing when the story captures your heart. And that happens when we begin to connect with this, the story emotionally and, and sometimes even when we find ourselves in the story somehow. It's an incredible experience and once you've been there, uh, you long to experience it again. And I can tell you as much as I love to hear a good story or watch a good story or read a good story, I love to tell a good story. Because I love what it does in the lives of those that get a chance to hear the story. I like to see eyes getting wider, and I like to see heart connection and to feel that. And so we find ourselves here this weekend celebrating Easter. And we have to agree today, this, this is an amazing story. This is an incredible one. And I hope that there's been a time in your life when you've been captured by it. And I hope as well that it's not just one time, but I hope even this year you've been captured by the reality of this story again. I want that to happen today because, yeah, it's a holiday. It's a day that's on the calendar, and uh, it's, it's a day that we all get dressed up, right? And we're going to take some pictures. Hopefully you get a picture out in the atrium today. It's a time to gather with friends and family, and it's a time to share a great meal together uh, our kids are excited about the Easter bunny and Easter egg hunts and peeps. Are you a peeps person? Me? I'm not. Some of you are like, no, I'm not. I'm, my sister, Emily, is a huge peeps person. I like jelly beans better. I like jelly beans and chocolate. That would be fine with me. Um, this is a historical event, and we are celebrating today not a good story. We're celebrating a great story. And I hope this story has impacted you personally. So anyone that's trying to do a good job communicating anything today in preparation for that, you got to do what I did. So I Googled Easter. I Googled Easter. And in uh, 0.76 seconds, I got 912 million responses. Imagine that. I've read them all. I've read them all. No, I'm just kidding. I have not read them all. But what I do want to read to you today is a definition a definition of Easter that feels to me very textbook. And it also feels like it's missing something. So why don't you see if you would agree with me. Easter. The most important and oldest festival of the Christian church, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ and held between March 21st and April 25th on the first Sunday after the first full moon following the northern spring equinox. Now listen, I know what you're thinking. Like, ooh, I just learned some things I didn't know about Easter. I did too. But if you're like me, you're thinking, wait a minute. As cool as that is, it helps us set where it's going to land somewhere on a calendar, but it's missing a bunch. Don't you think? That is missing a bunch. Great definition falls a little short. To really understand Easter, we need to go back to the question that that video that you just saw posed to us. We have to go back to this first question, who is this man? Who is this Jesus? He was a son. He was a sibling. He had brothers and sisters. He was a friend. He was a carpenter and became a Jewish rabbi or a teacher. He was a miracle worker. He was a mentor to many. Some thought that he was their Messiah, thinking that that meant that he would be a military leader, perhaps with the power and the ability to deliver the nation of Israel from the Roman Empire. Others saw him as an enemy or a threat. On the day we call Good Friday, there are many that saw him as a criminal and as a man that had been executed. 
In the weeks leading up to Easter, we as a church have been in this series where we've been taking a look at seven different statements that Jesus made while he was hanging on the cross. It's been a, a really great series that's helped us to learn a little bit more about who he is, that he was the son of God. That he has a heart to forgive. Imagine even forgive the people that were crucifying him on the cross that day. That he was human. Just like you and I experienced the same things we do. And that he loved the people in his life deeply. That ultimately he became the sacrifice or the penalty for our sin. You know what I really like about Jesus? <clears throat> I like that he was a finisher. That he finished the task at hand. That he came and he did what his heavenly father had sent him here to do. And we learned as well that he really died. To understand who he really was, we also need to understand the implications of his death in the lives of the people that were there. It's important for us to reconnect with this because we need to be reminded that those were real people. With real emotion. Think about his family and friends for just a second. And it's likely that you've lost someone that you cared about deeply. Imagine what they must have been feeling. Broken, scared, fearful, emotionally crushed. How about those that called themselves his followers? Have you ever thought about what they would have been feeling? Confused? Disappointed? They're feeling grief. They're feeling conflicted, defeated. How about this uncertain? Don't you think that they probably even began to question some of the things that Jesus had taught? And how about his enemies? What do you think they were thinking? They were thinking they were victorious. But now let's just say pause from the story for a second. And aren't you glad that that's not where the story ends? That's not where this story ends. <clears throat> And that's why we're here today. Imagine this, if you will, 2,000, over 2,000 years later, here we gather in Castle Rock, Colorado, by masses to celebrate a story that happened a long time ago. And I don't know where you are on your faith journey. I don't know where you are in terms of this relationship with the Lord thing. But you'd have to agree with me that this event, this story, this great story that we're talking about today impacted history. Because here we are still talking about it all these years later. So I want to take you to that first Easter Sunday morning. Some ladies decided that they were going to go to the tomb where they had buried Jesus. Mark says this in Mark 16, starting in verse 2, very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid the body. You're right, whoever was that. That was awesome. <laughs> and you know, I think sometimes we get to this part and we've heard the narrative and we know the story. You know what I'm going to talk about today. And we kind of get lulled to sleep in the middle of the greatness of the story. And we forget the context. We forget that Jesus came, that he was real and that he had flesh and blood and that he hurt and, and that he went through all that he went through growing up and learning and teaching, and, uh, and doing these miracles, and then to the cross, and the pain, and when we talk about this story, listen, you have to agree with me, this is the best story ever. This is an incredible story. It's so much more than a holiday or a day on a calendar. It's way more than us getting dressed up and going to church. We looked at the things over the last several weeks that Jesus said while he was hanging on the cross, this Easter, I want to do something different. I want to look at the two questions, two questions that were asked to those that were there that first Easter Sunday. And I believe there's something in these questions that, that also you and I must answer. And that in answering these questions, they're going to help us understand. They're going to understand more who is this man, but they're also going to help us understand that we have a part in this story as well. 
And I wonder, if you look at your life for just a second, I'll bet you're like me. You, you ask a lot of questions. You're trying to figure things out just like I'm trying to figure things out. Like, what, what is this life really all about? Where do I find meaning and purpose? And how do I have value in all of this? Where do I find hope regardless of life's circumstances? And I would contend today that maybe what we're looking for can ultimately be found here in this amazing Easter story. So I want you to see these two questions with me. Starting in Luke chapter 24, again, these women that came to the tomb that day, look at verse 5. The women were terrified, and they bowed with their faces to the ground. And then the men, the angels, asked, now listen, look at carefully at this question, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? When I read these stories, what I like to do is try and imagine myself, put myself into the different spots of the different people and the different uh, characters that are part of the story. And so this time I looked at it in terms of like, what would it must have been like to be an angel, right? These guys, they knew the plan from the beginning, right? They know what's going down. They know the tomb is empty. And so these ladies come to the tomb. Now imagine those ladies, they're grieving a sense of loss. They're hurting. Their hearts are overwhelmed with everything that's going on. And they're looking into a tomb that used to have their friend in it. And the angels are like, isn't that great? And they're crying. So their question is this, why are you guys crying? Because they know something that these ladies don't yet know. And they ask this great question that we need to ask ourselves too, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? And I'm here today to tell you that this is a question that we must ask ourselves because we do the same thing all the time. In our pursuit to try and find answers for life, what is this about to find meaning and purpose? We're looking for life in ways and things that only ultimately bring more questions. And we pursue these things and give our lives to them only to find that it hasn't fulfilled us the way that we thought that they would. We get to these spots where we begin to think to ourselves, there, see if you haven't asked, there has to be something more, doesn't there? Because this seems relatively empty to me. I need to find some kind of purpose. And so if we're not careful when we're looking for life among things that really don't bring life, it leads to disappointment. And we do this in all kinds of ways. Maybe it's relationships that you think will bring meaning to life, and they do a little. Or how about living kind of vicariously through our children or the pursuit of finances? Maybe it's your job or being able to be a person that has some kind of recognition. You see, we do these things, and if we're not careful, we find ourselves at the end of a very long road trying to find purpose. And sometimes it feels like we've totally missed it. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? Now I want to jump to John's recording of this, and I want you to read with me Mary's experience, because to me, this one is awesome. In John chapter 20, verse 11, it says that Mary, she was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and she looked in, and she saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. And again... These angels, looking from a completely different perspective, ask Mary, woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. So I tried to put myself in her situation. What did Jesus look like the last time she saw him? He was beaten. He was bruised. He was hung on a cross, and he was dead. So her paradigm of what she's looking for, what you're going to see play out in this story, is incredible. Try and imagine what she must have been thinking and feeling. And so she responds and she says, because now she's so perplexed because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. Now look, she continues. She, in verse 14, she turns to leave that spot where she had stooped in to look at the tomb. And it looks, she turned to leave and saw someone standing there out of the corner of her eye. Look at this. It was, who was it? Jesus. Who's she looking for? Jesus, but she has no, and neither would we have any paradigm that this would even be possible. The last time she saw him, he was hanging dead on a cross. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. You know, I was thinking about that. Isn't that true for your life and my life too? That oftentimes, life's circumstances and situations get so complicated, get so overwhelming, that we get so fixated on our own circumstance and situation and we totally miss the presence of Jesus right there in the middle of it all. 
You see, we can find ourselves in this story. This is the last. She, maybe she was overwhelmed with emotion. Her eyes uh, are filled with tears. The risen Jesus is standing right in front of her, and she misses it. You see, the, what we celebrate today is Jesus' victory that can be our victory, and you don't want to miss this. So now you have to see how awesome this story plays out. And if you just think about it for a second, put your, like, what do you think it was like to be Jesus in this moment? And he's like, oh, dear, sweet Mary, I love you so much. You just missed that this was me standing here. Scriptures tell us that she thought that he was a gardener. Look at this. Look at verse 15. He says to her, think about this, dear woman. Now he asks, why are you crying? And here's the question I want you to see. Jesus asked her the question that you and I need to answer to, who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? This question is vital. It was vital for her. It's for me. It's vital for you. It's vital. Think about your life for just a minute and be honest with yourself. Look at your life. Look at your calendar. Look at where you invest your time, your talents, and your interests. Think about what preoccupies the most of your time and ask the question, who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Where are those answers to value and purpose and understanding the true meaning of life? Because I need to tell you today that this question is one that I need to ask myself every day. And it's a question that we need to ask ourselves this weekend. Who are we looking for? Look at verse 15. This is great. It gets awesome. She thinks that he's the gardener. <laughs> it's awesome. This Jesus, the risen Jesus is standing in front of her. She thinks it's the gardener. Now look at how hilarious this is. Sir, she said, if you have taken him, who's him? Him. If you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. <laughs> you got to know that in this moment, Jesus is smiling right here. He might even be like, his shoulders might be kind of going up and down because he's like, this is so great, right? And I want you to notice what it was that broke through all of Mary's confusion. Look at verse 16. Mary, Jesus said. And in that moment, when she heard him say her name, she turned to him and cried out, Rabbani, which is Hebrew for teacher. She knew immediately who it was when he called her name. Who was this man? What is Easter? These are vitally important questions. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Who is it that you and I are looking for? I want to read to you a couple of verses that, that are declarative statements from Jesus himself as he describes who he is. Listen carefully. John chapter 12, verse 46. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world. Can I stop there for just a second and tell you this morning when I picked up my phone and saw of these killings of over 200 people in Sri Lanka, I was reminded of the darkness in our world. Jesus said, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. John 10, 10, he said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So what is Easter? Look at what Jesus said. It's about us experiencing a life that outside of him we can't experience. And everyone is searching for life somewhere. God has placed this quest deep inside of us. We're all trying to figure this out. And I believe with all of my heart that the reason that we have this passion to figure this out inside of us is because he wants us to find him. He wants us to learn that the answer is in him. Sadly, in our lifelong quest to try and figure this out, many ignore the Lord, and we look for life where it can't be found, only to find ourselves with some relative emptiness. And it's important to realize that we can only find this in one of two places. Either you find this in the fullness in the life of Jesus, or you spend your life trying to find this fullness in things that our world offers. And there was a man that was stuck in this pursuit, just like you and I, and he was trying to figure this out, and he was making all kinds of crazy decisions that were leading to emptiness. And he had an experience where he began to understand differently what life really was about. And, and as he was trying to explain this journey, this pursuit that we're all on, he wrote something amazing that I want to read to you today. It's found in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, and it says this, 
they traded the truth of God for a lie. And they worshiped, look, they worshiped and served the things that God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. What is the lie? It's the lie that says that a, that a true, a true heart-satisfying life can be found anywhere outside of the creator. This is one of the cruelest lies ever told, and if you believe it, you're going to chase some things that ultimately are going to lead to an emptiness and a discouragement, and maybe you've even found yourself there in some ways. God alone is able to bring the deepest joy and the contentment that our heart is really longing for. He alone can infuse your heart with hope regardless of your circumstances and situations. And you know, here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid what you're thinking right now is, good job, Pastor Doug. That's what you're supposed to tell us. But I want you to know it's so much more than just what this book says about a story that happened 2,000 years ago. You see, this is a great story. And it's a great story because people have found themselves in the story, and so can you. And it's not only that people have found themselves in this story, but people want to talk about that. People want to share how this story has impacted them, and I want to share that with you. So, will you look at the screens in front of you, wherever you are, and I want you to hear some of my friends talk about how this story has impacted their lives. Let's watch this together. Prior to my life with Christ, uh, I was alone. I was scared. I was depressed. Kind of the saying with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, well, mine was drugs, rock and roll. I was looking for my next high. I spent a lot of time trying to make everyone around me happy, looking for acceptance and belonging. I dated a lot, and um, I did things that I'm ashamed of. Most of my seeking was always trying to understand what the world was like, what was on the other side, how far could I go. Started to get into drugs and uh, surrounded myself with a lot of violent environments. I was looking for answers in all the wrong places, pretty much. Using girls for sex, I was lying, I was cheating. Was never really happy, never really content to where I just couldn't really stop, it was a spiral. I had become very I would say religious. I thought that in a proud sense that, that God had picked um, the right person to be on his team, so to speak. Money was of major importance. Uh, I was a person driven by my career. I was uh, intolerant, impatient, had a short fuse, really didn't have a conscience about any of it. I just lived my life with no regard for the Lord whatsoever. I ended up making tiny decisions, little decisions throughout my life that just slowly stepped me away from where God wanted me to be. Kind of thinking, oh, I know God in my heart, he'll never change, but never really living the life that God set out for me. I did grow up in a, in a great Christian home in the church, knew all the answers, but I wouldn't say that it was something that I knew personally. I was raised going every Sunday to church. However, I did not have a relationship with Christ. I didn't know Jesus. I would make sure I was doing the right things, performing the right way, acting the right way. I was a church member, but I was really interested in having a successful career. I thought that I was a Christian, so I really didn't see that as a void in my life. I grew up in very poor neighborhoods, projects. I uh, was just surrounded by uh, prostitution, pimps. I just became part of my environment. I kept going farther and farther into that darkness, and it just was never fulfilling. I was never able to get enough of that. We've been through um, a lot of loss um, more recently. It hurt that my dad, who was probably my strongest spiritual mentor, God chose to take him. It's really ugly, and it's sad, and it's real, and it hurts. Around 26, I was newly married and pregnant. And then I lost a baby at 19 weeks. And I hit an all-time low. And uh, 
I cried out to God, and I was mad and frustrated. My dad, when I was around eight years old, was taken to prison and it pulled from my life. I was scared, I was alone. There was a lot of shame, how people would start to look at you. My family even would look at me that way. My little sister, who she would hate to be around me. The guilt and the pain of knowing that what I should have been doing for God um, just ate me up inside. I didn't feel like I could ever come back to and be forgiven by Him. I just, I remember feeling really alone. I remember different times, you know, looking at myself in the mirror and not really recognizing myself or knowing who I was. I've been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless in every pain. I've held everything together and watched it shatter. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. Chase my heart adrift and drifted home again. Plunder blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there. Sense of acceptance and purpose. I read the Bible, 
Jesus was just coming off the pages. He was talking about love. Talking about peace and joy. I thought I had that stuff, but it was just all artificial. He looked at me and just called me worthy and beloved and loved without having to do anything. He didn't leave me in that darkness and that pain. And now, looking back on it, I can totally see the path He had for me and how much He loved me. I knew that it wasn't about church. It wasn't about me trying to earn it or be good enough for it. I knew that my salvation completely revolved around Jesus. Almost immediately, I, I lost my anger problem. I didn't react to uh, the things around me the way I used to. I was much more tolerant. I was uh, much more patient, especially with my children. There's just a peace that comes over me, and I know it's His Holy Spirit saying, I know you don't understand what's going on and why it's happening, but I do, and I want you to rest confident in that. I'm just thankful that I serve a God who's bigger than anything I can handle or imagine. I've seen Him answer my prayers. I've watched miracles happen. Um, I've felt Him comfort me. My fear of, of depression or death or anything in this world are, are so much smaller because I know that my Father in Heaven is going to take care of me no matter how big the storm. Ever since I decided to put God first and not actually seek what I wanted but what God wanted for me, you know, experiencing joy and happiness. When you try to tackle your life by yourself, um, there's just a lot of pain and worry. Being close with God has helped me to not feel like I have to carry that burden, that He's got me no matter what. Even in the hardest of times, I could see God at work that I didn't realize in those moments. You are always forgiven. You are uh, always in the presence of God, and He's always seeking you even in the darkest of times. God's love didn't allow me to stay in that desperate searching. There was something better for me. Unconditional love and grace and mercy. Jesus took over everything, and it was great, and it was so much better. The Bible says that old things pass away, all things become new. That's the way it was with me. Everything became new.
thank Him for His love and His grace today. Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Can you sit down just for a second? Here's what I've been trying to tell you. This isn't just a holiday that we celebrate. This isn't just a good story. This is a great story. And the reason that it's great is because people find themselves in this story. It's incredible. And sometimes you hear this. They'll say this about a good story. They'll say, you know, it's based on a true story. This is not based on a true story. This is truth. And it's game-changing and it's life-changing. And when we hear stories like we just heard on the video, listen, that's the stuff that wrecks me. I hope it wrecks you. Where people that are trying to sort through and figure out what this life is about are able to find new life and find themselves in this story. And so I've been thinking about it. There's, there's a couple of things that make this story so incredible. The first thing I want you to hear is this. The reason that this story was written is that it was written for you. Have you thought about that? That's awesome. That means that it can be personal. And the other thing that I love about this story is that it's a story that doesn't ever end. It continues forever all the way into eternity. And your eternity, your destination in eternity matters because of this story. And so today, I don't know where you are on this exploration of things of faith. And I don't know where you are. I don't even know how you ended up here today. I'm glad you did. And you might say, Doug, man, I'm trying to sort this out. And you know, you've been talking to me today because I know how it feels to chase after all kinds of different things that I think or thought would bring true meaning in my life, only to find that after a lot of pursuing and a lot of hard work and effort, I find myself at kind of a, a dead end street feeling deep inside of me that there has to be something more. There's a reason for that. And when we're asking these questions, big questions about life, what is this all about and how do I find purpose and true meaning? I, I need you to hear me say this today. The answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus. And you could spend a lifetime searching for true purpose and miss this, and I promise you, you'll regret it. And the greatest thing about this story of Easter is that it has a chance to be your story too. Could you bow your head for just a moment? If you're here today and you're saying, Doug, man, I don't know. Bro, seriously, if you knew my story, listen, this room is full of broken people pursuing a perfect God. We've all been in a place where we, where we have had to reconcile in our hearts what this life is really all about, realizing that some of the things that we've chased down and chased hard have not brought the fulfillment that we hoped they would. And if you're here today and you all, you're even exhausted by this search, knowing that there has to be something more, this is your minute, this is your moment. This story can become your story too. And if that's you, will you just simply pray with me and right now, just pray, Lord, I'm tired. And I wanna understand life in a completely different way through the lens of the story that we've been talking about that we celebrate here at Easter. And I thank you that I can find myself in it and, and I wanna understand true meaning of life. And so today I realize and recognize I've fallen short of your perfect standard and I thank you. I thank you for what you've done on the cross for me and I take it that way today. And I thank you that that's not where it stopped but even though they put you in that grave, you came back out of that grave and that gives me hope for life. Will you help me to understand that? Will you help me to understand in a greater way what it means that, that my life would matter because of you? And Lord, I pray as well for each of us that are here today. Perhaps it's been years ago that we, that we understood this, that we made this decision ourselves to let this story be ours. Lord, will you help it to wreck us again today? Wreck us with gratitude for all that you've done. We love you, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand to your feet? Because here, here's what I'm convinced of. <clears throat> I think if we're struggling to understand what this life is all about, it would make great sense to me to chase hard after the one that conquered death. If he can conquer death, don't you think he knows something about life? 
And we need to follow after that today. And, and so there's something that we, that we do every year in the context of what we've been celebrating. This should even make it come alive in an even better way today. I say something, I say he's risen and you say, and that was really pathetic because if he has changed you and that life has become your story, then we should be able to say that with some oomph, don't you think? So let's try it again. He is risen. He is risen. Woo, I like it, I like it. Now listen, we're not quite done yet because we wanna sing this last song together, worshiping our incredible God. And as we do, I want your heart to be stirred today. Let it be stirred to a place where it almost kind of wrecks you once again. As we sing this song, allowing our hearts and our minds to be reconnected with the truth that we serve a risen king. Let's sing this song together.
right now, those who made first time decisions for Jesus. Come on, this is a big deal. Heaven is celebrating and so are we. And if that's you and you're going, well, what's next? We wanna make sure we're walking alongside of you and we're getting resources in your hand. If you made a first time decision, there are these packets in the back of the room. We'd love for you to grab one. Two things before you go. Next week, we're kicking off our new series called The Fourth Wall. And it's all about acknowledging God's presence in our everyday lives. We'd love to see you there. Please note our services go back to normal times next week, Saturday at 4.30, Sundays at 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Also starting next week, first step. If you're new or maybe you've been coming for a while and you're not yet connected, after every service next weekend, our staff will be across the hall from the auditorium in those meeting rooms to meet you, answer questions, and let you know how you can get connected here at Plum Creek. Our ushers will be at the back doors to receive your giving and next step cards. We hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Happy Easter.